Hello, my name is Myesha Wester. I'm a global professor sponsored by the British Academy at the University of Sheffield. And my research is in Gothic studies, particularly how race is represented in the Gothic and how we use Gothic and horror tropes to talk about race in our modern discourses. So today we're gonna to talk about anti-blackness in the Gothic in particular. I'm gonna start with a general overview of some tropes and themes that we see in the Gothic, just as a reminder. So we're going to start with an overview of some Gothic tropes. Uh, so here we have on this slide a list of some very common tropes. I have to admit, these aren't all of them. But for the sake of time, here are the major hitters when we talk about the Gothic. Now when we talk about the British Gothic, we're talking about lots of ruinous isolated landscapes that are typically dotted by castles, ruined monasteries, and abbeys. Now these monasteries, abbeys, and castles quite often represent antiquated sociopolitical history. They signify beliefs and ways of living that we're supposed to be beyond because they're regressive and barbaric. Their presence in the Gothic means that we're not nearly as enlightened or sophisticated as we like to think, which is really what the Gothic does. It reminds us that at our heart, there's still some savagery there. Now, those that are in bold and crimson on this screen are tropes that are especially mobilized when we talk about anti-blackness in the Gothic. One of the ways we can think about anti-blackness in the Gothic and the appearance of race in the Gothic is just by thinking about the typical color scheme we see when we talk about the villains and the heroes. If we think about how villains are often described in the Gothic, it's in terms of darkness, blackness, shadows, a kind of otherness that is never, ever fully white. But when we talk about the heroes and heroines, and especially when we talk about the heroines, what we see is a color scheme that tends towards hyper whiteness. So think about your average heroine. She's often blonde haired, blue-eyed and super pale. Whereas her counterpart, the seductress or villainess, is often the exact opposite. Dark eyes, dark hair, wandering around typically in dark colors. In other words, even when characters aren't literally racially marginalized, we are reminded of racial difference by color, by how they are marked. Now, when we think beyond tropes, we get to the question of Gothic themes and anxieties, which are fairly persistent. And for me, this as a theorist, but also as a social commentator, is really one of the ways in which the Gothic reminds us that we're, we're not progressing, that we remain trapped in our antiquated ways because, well, our thematic anxieties aren't changing. But anyway, um, when we talk about some of our persistent anxieties, we have to realize that in a culture that's fairly concerned with progress, we're perpetually horrified by any failure because it means we can't and haven't moved forward. Thus the Gothic is as much about the horror of these issues, these anxieties, as well as understanding and locating the source of the problem, the origin of the failure. Now, in many of the tropes listed here, like number one and two, for instance, we can see an explicit concern over the dissolution of society that could be readily blamed on interlopers, on foreigners, people that come from without. But when we look at some of these other themes, what we also see is a horror over civilized behavior, the sense that the civil is a thin mask veiling what's still ultimately barbaric. So again, if you look at number 12, we see an iteration of anxiety over essentially our chickens coming home to roost, a concern over the ways in which the evils we have done will return to haunt us. And this can then be related to number 13 in this list, in which we see a breach of borders that we should have left alone producing horror. 
Now, number 12 and 13 are really well exemplified in texts like Dracula and Frankenstein. And we'll talk about Frankenstein in a little bit, particularly in terms of anti-blackness. But both begin because someone did or went someplace they shouldn't have gone and it followed them. The evil followed them home. Now, we're going to pause here for an interlude because I want to challenge you. I want you to look up the music video, The Bird and the Worm by Use. It's readily available on YouTube and I've given you the link here on, on the slide. As you look at this video, how many tropes and themes can you catch? So we're going to take a pause, have a look at the video, and we'll be right back. Did you enjoy your video? I hope you enjoyed tracking the gothic that is all over this video. We're going to move on next to another important gothic theme, which is the grotesque. Now, again, our current, particularly Western society, really likes borders, boundaries, and categories. The grotesque, simply put, is about boundary and category transgression and blurring. It is horrible because it proves how permeable existence ultimately is. So for example, take the notion of the border between our bodies and the external worlds. Horror arises every time we confront the fact that we are readily permeable things, that our bodies are constantly being penetrated from without. Take the human body itself. We assume we are either living or dead. Now I have to warn you, this next point is a bit morbid, but it's true. Because we are dying in every moment of our living. But that is horror for us. A happier example, perhaps, is this notion that machines are unthinking tools. We categorize them as an object that has no sense or cognizance or agency on its own. So, why then do our machines have a habit of doing things we don't want them to do? Now, when we think about the grotesque in architecture and art, we have to think about it as a kind of styling that really emphasizes arrangements of arabesque that interlaced garlands and small and fantastical human and animal figures. Now, individually, the elements within this grotesque art can be pleasing, they're usually lovely. But when you bring them all together, what we see is a whole that is overwhelming. And this too is, again, a manifestation of the grotesque and how it works. The pleasing is also a point of disturbance and distress. Grotesque art is wonderful for manifesting the instability of the center. When we look at the art, for instance, on this slide, what we see is refusal of the border and difference between the center and the margin. So if you particularly look at the center and left image on this slide, we're called to question, what is the center of those images? What are we, what are we supposed to be most interested in? The letter or the figure? or the flourishes that we might otherwise call ornamentation, but which ultimately overwhelm the whole of the image. And this returns us to our Gothic anxieties and themes. Like the return of the repressed and anxiety about the actual extent of our progress and powers, our constant encounters with the Lacanian real keep reminding us that we're not nearly as advanced or enlightened as we like to think.